So this is pretty impromptu, but I was going to, uh, I'm giving a talk at uh, Nebraska JS in January on Node. Um, so I don't have anything prepared for this, but I can go over quickly um, some cool things about it. Because uh, I, I work for a startup um, called Pollenware out of Kansas City, and we do 100% JavaScript uh, Node with jQuery and uh, Backbone on the front end. So play around with this all day. Is that what is that gonna be viewable on the top? Pretty small. <clears throat> oh. okay. Nice. Okay. So um had a list of things that I came up with to go over. So an intro, uh node is a framework uh, a server-side framework written in JavaScript that gives you access to um, to uh, different different um, types of I/O, like for file systems, H creating HTTP server, uh, traffic. It's built on top of Google's V8 JavaScript engine, so the same engine that powers Chrome powers Node, um, and it lets you write server-side applications, server-side uh, command line tools, uh, libraries, etc. And um, it's in pretty active development, very popular. Uh, it's at, currently at version 0 0.8.14. And um, so some of the benefits of it are it lets you write all of it. Like if you, if you use it and you're doing a web app, you don't have to context switch between two languages. Everything is going to be seamless. And you can share components between the, the front end and the back end. So we do some template sharing. And when we pass data from the client side to the server side, we're just passing JavaScript objects, so we don't have to serialize to another format and then um, deserialize it out of there. And uh, so that, that's really nice. Um, there's some negatives to it too. Uh, it makes it difficult to um, to do some things because of its nature. It's uh, non-blocking I/O, and so. Uh, that can be painful, especially in the beginning, because you're not, um, you know, thinking about that, and so you you try and read a file or read a, a database call, and it doesn't happen right away. So it's kind of weird having to think about rearranging the program to do that, and it can get into this this uh, state where we call callback hell, I guess, because it's just a call call after call after call wrapped inside of each other. <clears throat> um, so installation, you can just go to Node, Node's website, and click the install button, and it'll immediately start downloading for your system. Um, you can also install like through Homebrew or uh, some other tools. I'm sure on Windows. I don't know. Um, then, when you have it installed, you just click that, and it'll run through a wizard and install. Uh, I've already got it installed here. Zero eight nine. And so, when you get it installed, you'll get a node command line tool. You can run it. If you just run node by itself, it puts you into a REPL. So then I can just do basic JavaScript in here. And it will run it immediately. And so, yeah, it. Um, then you can also. Um, you can also type create programs. Oops. I'll just do test.js. And in here I can do and to run that, same as any other. Uh, language, just type node and it'll execute it. So um, it's also got a package manager called, um, well actually you can you can require files so if I did um, let me do lib, create lib.js and in here say um, module.exports equals and then it, back in test, I can do var 
name equals require lib. So I'm requiring that other file, which is in my directory right here. I think that works. Yeah. So it's reading from the other uh, each file because you don't have it. So in, normally in JavaScript. When you're thinking about it on in the browser, you have a global window object, and in here in Node, I think you have a I think it's called globals or global. But then when you are writing those files, you have that module dot exports that you can add stuff to, and I'll show a little bit more of that when I talk about Express. Um, so you can you can write up code in there and then export it so that it can be used by other files and shared. So uh, then there's libraries that you can pull up just like um, CPAN or uh, Gem. There's npm that Node has, and so this comes with Node when you install it. Uh, you can, and then you can just type the npm command and uh, and so uh, this is important because even if you don't use Node, uh, chances are you might use some tools that are written in Node, and you can get them easily from NPM. Uh, an example is we do all of our, we lint all of our code using JS hint, and so there's a JS hint NPM module, so we install that as a dependency. And when you do that, you can say NPM install JS hint, and it will go get it, go get all of its dependencies, and then it puts it, it creates this node modules directory right there. I'm sorry if that's hard to read. Uh, creates that node modules directory and puts it in there. So if I look inside of node modules, you can see that everything that it put in there, so there's all of the dependencies for, for the package I put and then all of its dependencies. If I want to run JSHint globally, I can just do an npm install g JS hint to install it globally, which will put it in user local somewhere. And then now I can just run JS hint like a normal command line tool. Same thing with um, another one we use a lot is less for, uh, for like a, a CSS preprocessor. And so, oops. And just do that and install less, and then I can do less c to compile my less, where I give it a file name, and uh, it'll export uh, the valid CSS for it. So we use that all over. So the, there's a lot of tools written in Node uh, that are pretty powerful, um, including uh, there is there's a JavaScript build tool, or um, kind of like a, a JavaScript equivalent of make called Grunt, and it's written in Node. And uh, we were starting to use it more and more uh, for building uh, and linting our code and running our unit tests. And uh, there's another package. I, I haven't used it, but Twitter developed it called uh, Bower, which is a JavaScript, a client-side JavaScript, um, I guess, version of NPM. It lets you say Bower install jQuery, and it will put jQuery into this components library. So then you can just go get the latest jQuery or Backbone or whatever client-side library as part of your deployments. You can just have a deployment script that will go grab the latest version or whatever version you specify and throw it in there. So you don't have to check in this, the jQuery source or whatever into your project. But we still do that right now, but you can get around that. Uh, sorry, you might have one minute and say it all again. So I, instead of <laughs> embedding yeah. So I'll install it right now as a global. Going and grabbing a bunch of stuff. Now I can say, oops, I can say Bower and see what what the um, command is. So now if I want to get jQuery, I can say Bower install jQuery. And so what it'll do is it creates this components. Uh, directory, and then you can see inside of there I have a jQuery directory, and then inside of there 
jQuery.js. And if I look at the components jQuery component.json, this is its uh, file that specifies what, um, what the package is. Any dependencies that it has would be right here, so it would know to go and install those dependencies. So I bet if I do a Bower install backbone, backbone depends on jQuery and underscore. So you can see right there that it's fetching underscore, and maybe it already knows that I have jQuery. But now if I go look at components backbone component.json, I can see that my dependencies, I guess it's only listing underscore as a dependency, and anything greater than or equal to version 131. But it's building all this on my local disk, mm -hmm. which I then still include in my project. You could, or you could, so it create, by default it creates that components directory, and you could git ignore that, or svn ignore, and then not check it in and just have it grab each time, or have it grab from a different repository and build that separately. We do the same thing with the node modules. We don't check in node modules, but when I do, if I want to install, um, well, I'll, sh I'll, I'll get to the package.json for node modules, but that's, the node modules has a similar JSON file that you can keep track of all the dependencies for your project. And so then you can just say npm install, and it will look at that package.json, see that you require less, you require express, connect all of these and it will go get all of them for you. So when you set up a new dev environment or whatever, you can just say npm install, go grab everything and not for server side code bases. For server side, the bower is for client side. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So um, yeah, that's npm. So then uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the um, non-blocking IO. Um, so, in normal normal programming, you would do something where you want to get a query. You would do like dv dot um, select some SQL, and then you you would have that query object, and then I can do query dot. Um, you know, if that was returning a a name, then I could just console.log that right here. And so you don't, it's really easy to just run your query and then get the result and use it. For Node, the biggest headache that I ran into, especially when trying to develop some simple command line utils, was that you don't get, you don't have uh, blocking I.O. So the way you would write this for node is you would pass it a callback that would then give you that query and so then inside of here I have that query. This function will get run when the query is available. The problem with that is now if I wanted to take that query and do something else with it then I have to do it again and then again maybe and again maybe and etc. So it can get really confusing and really difficult because you have this whole hierarchy of, of things to do and in the meantime this would get run right away. So your, um, your program loop would just keep going, and that would just run when it's available, when, when the I.O. gets done. So if I want something, if, if this can't run until after all of this has happened, then I have to coordinate that and put it in here. Because every step of that is not blocking. Right. Okay. So that's, that, the you, that's the way you do sequential operations? Yeah. So it's a big pain. You mean that's everything? <laughs> yeah. So have you used any other other libraries that help you with that though, with async or promises or anything like we that? We do. Yeah, we use we use promises heavily. Okay. Um, we have a library that a coworker uh, created called Comb, 
and this is like a kitchen sink library that does everything. Um, but the biggest thing is it gives us promises. And so we, we would do that, like if I want to read a file, I could say, or at the, require the file system um, module. And then I could say fs read file, and I think what was it lib. That js was a file. And then pass it back a function with the text. I'm not sure if this works. I'm just doing this off the cuff. But maybe I could just print out. Oops. So I, I didn't do it right, but it would do. You could do something like that, and or if I needed the contents of this file, then I would have to do it again and again. But uh, what Comb lets us do is, oops, I could say Comb require that, and then I could Comb dot wrap this. And so um, what comb.wrap would do is it would return me a promise. And then I, so I can say comb.wrap and then I can say, well, promise, when that is uh, done, then run this. And then later, if I wanted to do something else when it's done, And then later, if I wanted to do something when it fails. Now, it's a little less of a pain because we can do, do this everywhere. But um, this comb library has a lot of built-in uh, promise, promise classes that let you um, shorten that. So in the, in the original example, I just learned about that in Vim. That's cool. Um, so to make something like this similar or saner, you could do um, with comb. You could do comb dot. I think it's chain, but I have to double check. But I mean, th this is just our solution to it. And what comb dot chain does is it or not? Um, yes. Yeah, comb dot. So we could we could um, wrap this in a comb dot wrap, which all that does is it takes the um, the. Excuse me. Let me do this. So I'll, I'll just copy this, and then do it again. And this time I'll do it in comb dot wrap. So this takes the um, prompt the asynchronous code and wraps it in a, or the, the, the callback way and wraps it in a promise. So then we get that promise back. And then instead of passing it a function here, oops, um, I could do a dot chain. And what it would do is it would take, in this case, the select, the value that we're returning and pass it to this next method that we would do something else. So then we could do a db.insert, call insert. Uh, I'm probably not getting the syntax exactly right, but it's, it's very, like essentially we can take the output or the, the result of one function and pass it directly into the other, because that's... So the pie picking wins. Right, yeah. That's essentially what we're doing here is we're taking if, I, if this was an actual query, which I'm sorry it's not, but if it was, we would be doing something with it and then passing it to another, and then passing it to another. And this just kind of cuts that out. If you don't have to do anything special, you're just getting the result and then immediately passing it somewhere else. 
Um, this shortens things so we can write a little more crisp code. I would argue that it's maybe a little more cryptic just because you have these comb.wrap.chain everywhere, but it does make it a lot cleaner and easier to maintain. And there's a lot of methods that we have to do all of that. Um, like when, when we'll give, you can give it asynchronous and synchronous code in this as arguments and it will just, when all of those have completed, then it will run this. And that's where maybe if you don't care about the output of each, or maybe it gives you the output in an array. Or if you want to run things in order, you can run them serially. And the nice thing about the wrap is you can take any built-in node command and uh, wrap it and then get a promise instead. So we can kind of write all of our code, not just the code we choose to with promises. We can take everything and wrap it in a promise. OK, um, so that was that. And then I wanted to talk about Express a little bit. And this will actually be somewhat working examples, which will be nice. So just delete that. So Express is a framework. Has anybody used like Sinatra or um, Grails, maybe? Grail, uh, Grails is a little overkill, but it basically just the routing part of Grails, uh, which is all Sinatra is, is like the routing part of Sinatra. You just do, you can just specify when somebody, when there's a git request to slash login, here's my code, do the, return this, return this template or return this message or return this error. Um, that's kind of what um, Express is to a point. It, it does some more and it does some, some different things. So we can install Express globally to give us the Express object on our path. And so now I can just type express and I get an app. Now I can delete that and oops, uh, I can do it. Oops, express help and see the options. So I can say express and let's say I want to use less for my CSS. So it'll automatically set up everything and then I want to use Hogan for my JavaScript templates, which is a mustache templating engine. And I want to support sessions. Well, we won't do that because this is simple. So I can just do that and it will create my app exactly the way uh, I want it. So it creates this app.js. This is the package.json that I was talking about. So this just says that for this application, which we can call node talk. I want to, I, I need Express version 303, any version of Hogan.js, and any version of the less middleware. And so when I, oops, when I run npm install, you'll see that it's getting Express, it's getting the middleware, and it's getting Hogan and all of the dependencies that they require. And throws it in, so now we have this node modules directory that has all of that so now that that's installed, I can just do node app.js. Oops. I didn't do anything. Right? So I didn't do anything. I don't know why it would be. Because the address is use. So you're using the same port. Oh, what if I, I am. Totally am. Okay, so now I have a server started on port 3000, which is just serving up Welcome to Express. And so if I look at, I'll just start that down here. If I look at uh, app.js, I can see that I'm requiring the node modules uh, that I require, like Express, HTTP, which is built in, and path and then the routes that I'm using so I'll show those in a second uh, then you create a new express object or uh, express instance and you can configure it so right here we're telling it to run 
on port 3000. We're telling it where our views directory is. So if I look at the directories, we're telling it that we have our views in here. Um, telling it to use, this literally just adds a fav icon to the page. Very pretty. Um, and then right here, we're telling it where our public directory is. Oh, I'm sorry, right here we are. We're telling it where our public directory is. Up here, we're telling it that uh, to use less middleware, so it's pretty nice. We can, inside of public style sheets, you see we have a style.css and a style.less. I can change the background color to red. And, I, and then I can show inside of the main index file. But right here, we're asking for style.css, but I changed style.less. But when I update the page, that less middleware is picking up the request for less that, or app.css app and uh, compiling less.css to app.css and then delivering that instead. And so, yeah. Um, back in here. So after I have all of that, I can set up um, environment based configurations. So show errors uh, basically in development. So if I try and go to that, it tells me that I can't go there, which you can, in production, you could set it up to go to a 404 page or whatever. And then here's where I configure my routes. So I'm saying when somebody, when there's a git request for slash, call routes.index and routes is this object right here, which is required in dot slash routes. So routes, because it's pointing at that directory, it's actually going to grab the index file in that directory. So I can see in here, I'm just exporting this function. And the function gets a request and a response object. And so I can do anything with the request and deliver on the response. So I could do res.render, which tells it to render the index view. So it looks in the views directory for index and pass in, oops, pass in this data, title express. So in here, we can see that we're saying, welcome to title. And so I could say, name, pass that in, oops, save that. And then in index, I could pass in a name, and I probably have to restart the server for this. But. So after I restart, now I can see that it updated. And so there's a lot of different, the, the nice thing about this layout is it gives you kind of a lot that you can um, configure. Like it, 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 this is the boilerplate that it gives you when you run the Express app, but if you saw our app, it looks completely different from this. Um, we moved the public directory out to more of a kind of its own module uh, because we're heavy client side. And then we, we treat this especially, essentially just as a services directory. Oops. And we, um, oh my gosh. Um, Yeah, we just we just create restful routes in here, and that, that's it, I guess. Uh, does anybody have any questions or something else you want me to go over? What database do you guys use? Okay, yeah, um, we use Postgres and also Mongo, and so we connect to. I think there is a node native Mongo driver that we use, node MongoDB native. And so it, when we install, we install node through, or MongoDB through NPM, and it gives us the, the native driver so we can connect to an instance of it and then run that. Now for, uh, for, uh, Postgres, we use 
another library developed by us called Patio. And this, um, if, if you've used uh, SQL in Ruby, like the SQL gem that is like a ORM, it's very similar to that. Um, it gives you the, it, it, it'll connect to the database it supports, I think, Postgres and MySQL right now. And uh, it'll give you models that you can then use to talk to your database. And um, yeah, so that, that's what we're using right now. I, I haven't done a whole lot of the database programming yet, so it's still pretty new to me, but there's uh, a lot there. We It's pretty proven. We've had it in produ production for over a year now, and it's performed really well. Um, yeah. So how much code do you share between client and server? Uh, we share, right now, we share um, templates a lot. And so then for, hmm, yeah, templates is probably the thing we share the most. And then we have, um, we have, like for the for those RESTful services with Express, like it's nice that we can query the database with Patio, get get back a JSON or a, a object literal, and then just say res.send, which I'm sure you do you do pretty much the same thing in Ruby, but it's you, I mean you're passing a hash map a hash map back, but it's it's pretty much seamless. I I guess the our mindset is that it's seamless just because we're not the the syntax is always the same. And then if you, this is the other way too, if you post in jQuery, no JSON, you can just get the object out. Yep. Yeah, it goes straight up and nice. really easy to read out. What about automated testing? Automated testing. So <laughs> we use another library for, um, I don't know, that my coworker wrote called it for server side. And there it is. Uh, so this, it's a uh, kind of inspired by RSpec, I'd say. Um, we use that on the client on the server side, uh, but it doesn't work in the front end. So we use Jasmine on the front end, and it's also kind of inspired by RSpec. Um, but we do a lot of we we use that and we use Sign On on both. Uh, Sign On .js is a Framework agnostic library for providing spies, stubs, mocks. Uh, for the server or the client side, it provides a fake server, which is really awesome. So we can do, we can fake out our, we can catch all requests to the server, tell it what to respond with right in the test, and then run it. And we don't have to wait. We can also run, um, we use timers, like set timeout a lot, so we can speed up the timers with sign on. Uh, so we don't have to sit around and wait seconds for the test to pass or fail. But it's a really cool library and it works. It's framework agnostic and works in Node, so we use it there as well. Do you host JS with the Node server like that? Or do you hook it up back to your signal? Yeah, so uh, we're still figuring that out. With um, so we have two apps right now. Uh, w the enterprise app is a Ruby backend, but we use Node in some places. So I think there's Nginx in front of it that passes it off to Node. Uh, for this new one, we're probably going to do the same thing: have the client side code hosted statically by um, Nginx because Node isn't good for hosting static content. But then for uh, for the services, it'll something will pass it off to, some proxy will pass it off to, to node instances running. That's also a, one thing that's bad about node is it's, um, it's single threaded. So we, if we can't utilize um, multi-threaded goodness because of that. So we, we fork off some processes. We, or we're, we're experimenting with that to speed things up, but node's pretty fast in itself. 
say you forecast an open process or are you done something else? No, we, for, we forecast node processes. So it's in the we're into the background processes? Yeah. So what do you do with longer ending tasks? Are you done that far? Uh, yeah. Like I said, we're still working. It's a, a big work in progress right now. This app's not in production. And Happy with it? Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. It's fast and, uh, I mean, we, we s the, the one downside, I guess, to this stuff is that everything is so new that there's not a lot of documentation. There's a lot of crappy NPM modules out there, and sure. it's really tough to, to steer clear and to avoid not writing everything ourselves. That's also <laughs> something that we can spin our wheels on. As you can see, we have an ORM, a utility library, and a test framework. <laughs> That one I don't think does fork processes, um, and it doesn't get high traffic. We actually, it's not a multi-tenant setup, so each customer has their own instance, okay. so it's pretty small. And this is going to replace that, yeah. so it'll be the same deal. Oh no, it's it's going to replace it, but it'll be multi-tenant. Okay. We expect, we hope for thousands of connections. We've we've uh, been running tests and just had like robots hitting our server, hitting the services and had thousands of them concurrently and it, it's held up pretty pretty well. What's the volume of data that goes through? Like how big is the database? Um, it's going to be big. We, we expect to have, like customers will come in and they'll, like, so we accept in their, their um, invoices as, uh -huh. right now as CSVs and we, we expect to be able to handle them uploading hundreds of thousands of rows from a CSV file and us processing it, finding errors, and then either alerting them or throwing it in the database. And yeah. So we, ex we expect some pretty high, high uh, data going through it. Uh, we, we've been trying to test from the start with high levels of data, so when I'm, when I'm running, I, have, I usually have App, um, CSVs lying around that I'll try that I'll test uploading that are at least five thousand rows and up. But um, and your uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I know you're not as big in the database. And uh, so, uh, you know how many tables you're talking about? And, you know, for I'd say it's about fifteen to twenty. Okay. Yeah, I've been doing, I've been mostly on the client side for this. Uh, I started, I created the original Express Routes and then have been building out the, the client side. So it's a, it's a single page app. And we use Backbone and jQuery for that. Um, and, and then we've got a couple other guys. One other guy that has been wor working the, the server side end and then another guy that's kind of been floating between the two. And so... Yeah, I, I'm trying to get more into the server side, which is why I'm excited to talk about Node more and more. I'm going to do a, a more in-depth talk when I have time to sure. to do it in January. But uh, you yeah, know, this was an okay intro, I guess. It's really easy to get started. Um, there's good resources, lots of good uh, screencasts and walkthroughs, even on the Node site. The one downside is Express may have gotten better but they just upgraded to version 3.0 and this documentation is just horrendous or at least it was it might be getting better the API is not bad there's a guide up there as well what's that to the right of API reference guide that's that's a good place to start oh is it oh cool yeah when i when we first started this project it was still express 2 and <laughs> i went and, uh, they, the the site looked completely different and they had two screencasts right on the page, and they were both like completely out of date when I watched them. So it was terrible. So we upgraded, or we, we started with the release candidate of Express 3 and have been working ever since. And Express 3 just got released a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, but the guy who write, wrote this has like 200 something projects in NPM. 
TJ Holloway check. Oh, Yeah, it's it's a fun fun little framework, and it's easy to get get set up, especially if you're just doing like ser RESTful services. You can quickly get this set up. I, before this, I was working with Sinatra, and I I don't see it being too much. I, I see him being pretty similar uh, in getting services set up. Thanks.